it's time for the next to last review. And yes, I do have a slight talking point here just so I can more or less keep on track. Though I don't have everything, it gives me my chapters, my main characters, and some of my review. Again, my printer is starting to, you know. <laughs> it, it needs a new change, but now it's the silver chair, which is book six. Silver Chair is one that I kind of knew a plot of, but I didn't know exactly every detail to it. So that was an interesting time. Your main characters is Eustace, Jill, Puddleglum, Aslan, King Caspian is there for a little bit. He's still important. Prince Rillian and the Lady of the Green Kirtle. Your chapters are behind the gym. Jill is given a task. The sailing of the king. Parliament of Owls, Puddle Glum, The Wild Waste Lands of North, The Hill of Strange Trenches, The House of Harfang, How They Discovered Something Worth Knowing, Travels Without the Sun, In the Dark Castle, The Queen of the Underland, Underland Without the Queen, The Bottom of the World, The Disappearance of Jill, and The Healing of Harms. So... This one had, like I said, 16 chapters. A decent amount of people that I know, obviously. I know Eustace, I know Caspian, I know Aslan. Jill is referenced in the movies, but never actually seen. She's referenced at the end of Voyage of Dawn Treader because, you know, his mom's like, hey, yeah, Jill Pool's here. So, starting off strong, Jill and Eustace are running away from bullies at their boarding school. And that's whenever they're sent off to Narnia. Wasted no time there. And they're on top of this massive hill. I'm not gonna lie, Jill's kind of showing off. And Eustace goes to try and pull her away from the edge. And he falls! I... I know he didn't die. But I kind of laughed a little bit. Because, you know, he went on this grand adventure on the sea. He gets back to Narnia and instantly he's falling. <laughs> Jill is stunned. Too stunned to speak. And then Aslan shows up. And I, I know everything's gonna be fine. Aslan saves him. He gets to Narnia safe and sound. And Jill's given her task. Which I had to write down because I would not remember the signs either. But he tells her, hey, yeah, you need to do this. You need to remember these signs. There's four of them. And they are as following. As soon as Eustace arrives in Narnia, he will meet an old friend, and he must greet that friend at once. Task two. You must leave Narnia and travel north to the city of ancient giants. Task three. You will find writing on a stone in that city, and you must do what it is, what the writing tells you. And finally, task four, you will know the lost prince if you find him by this, that he will be the first person you have met in your travels who will ask you to do something in Aslan's name. Now, the whole point of this book is the fact that Caspian, he had a son, Prince Rillian, to Lily, the star lady from Voyage of Dawn Treader. She's dead at this point, and her son, his son has vanished. They're on the quest to find this prince before Caspian dies because he's very old and he would like to see his son, you know? It's been a very long time. He misses his wife, he misses his son who just vanishes and it's under mysterious circumstances. So that's when you get Eustace and Jill. They're gonna go on this grand adventure. She needs to repeat these to herself every morning and every night so she gets it in her head. And then he sends her off and they immediately mess it up. As soon as he gets there, he sees this old looking king board a boat. It's Caspian. He doesn't put two and two together and he misses his mark. He doesn't get to talk to Caspian. Instead, he talks to a very old Trumpkin. But he can't hear that well. So they end up meeting these owls. It's like, hey, yeah, he's never actually going to let you go hunt for this guy. But you're going to go and you're going to go look for this guy. 
tiny like a frog a dude. He's named Puddleglum. Fun name. Really sets the tone for his character. He's a rather glum dude. Glum outlook on life. But you're going to meet him and he's going to help you on this journey. So they do that. They go find him. He, can I find a picture of dear old Puddle Glum quickly? That is the true question. Here he is. Ain't he nice? Uh, so yeah, he's kind of like a frog guy. He's just hanging out. But he's going to help them on their journey. He is your negative tone for their positive tone throughout the whole entire book. As soon as we meet him in chapter 5. So they go set off. They're not technically okay with the idea of going because they need to go to Harfang, which is a giant territory. Giants and Narnia, outside of like one or two, are usually aggressive. They're very angry. They don't like Narnians, they don't like people, but they have to go that way anyway because that's where they're meant to go. So they go. They left. That one, they didn't really screw up. They did leave. And they want to go track down the ancient city of giants. Gracie sees Callie out the window. I apologize. So they find out that, hey, yeah, we actually did go to the ancient city of giants, but they meet this lady with a green kirtle and a silent knight on the journey. And instead of going directly to the ancient city, they get sent to Harfang where the giants are, and they're getting ready for this wonderful festival. So they go, and they become honorary guests in the lady's name. Stay a little while, and things start to feel a little weird. I mean, it would be weird anyway to hang out with giants whenever you're a small child and a marsh wiggle. Uh, that's what Puddle Glum is. But they hang out, at least one of the nights, and it's Jill that finds it weird first. Granted, the other ones do find it weird, but she first suspects stuff. And that's when Aslan comes in and he points her into the direction because while they're on their journey, before they got to the actual castle itself, they noticed these weird, like, holes. It's words. <laughs> she can see it plainly from her window that it's telling her that they need to go beneath something. So they end up trying to make a jailbreak the next day and when they go through the kitchens they realize that the humans are going to be in a pie if they stay any later and stay for the actual celebration. So it was right not to trust the giants because they were going to eat them, as giants do in stories. So, they managed to escape, all well and good. And they end up falling down into a hole. They're being chased by the giants and the army, more or less. They went out on a hunting party, the king and his men, which is why they were able to escape when they did. Puddle Glum's always talking about, oh, well, this is it. We're either going to starve or we're going to get killed or we're going to just waste away in these. Like I said, you're negative. You always have a negative and you always have a positive. The children are the complete opposite. Though Jill did have an issue where she didn't want to continue repeating everything that she was bent to. She didn't want to keep reciting her task because she just really, really, really wanted a nice bed, which is why she wanted to go to Harfang instead. Because the lady is like, oh yeah, they'll treat you right there. You can have your own bed, you'll have a feast. And that's when she stopped. She took her eyes off of the prize, took her eyes off of finding the lost prince, and that's where things went wrong. That's why they got in the hands of the giants and they almost became supper. 
or dessert technically, but eventually they end up actually listening and they followed the instructions. They went underground and covered themselves in so then they wouldn't be found by the giants. But that's when they found the Earthmen. Dwarves. Not dwarves. Gnomes. They found the gnomes who are under the control of the Lady of the Green Kirtle, who is their queen. The woman that set them up to be killed by the giants. Who also, if you remember, had a very silent night. He did not say a single thing while they were on their journey when they met each other at the bridge. After a very, very long journey, passing even Father Time himself, in the underground, they come to the Queen's territory of the Underland. Now, if you know anything about me, I would have struggled. Even if I was skinny. I am very claustrophobic and I don't like the dark. So I probably would have just gave up and died. <laughs> because I cannot do the dark. Mm -mm. No, I, I went into a cave once with my school and I nearly had a panic attack. So that was fun. Uh, I did not like any time they were in the dark. They were in the dark for a very long time. They got to chapter 10 and from 10 to 15 they are in the dark they are in the underland for a good chunk of it and they come across guess who the missing prince he was the knight the whole time who would have saw that coming eh but his whole thing is that there's the silver chair and for one hour a night he comes to his senses because he is under a spell he wants to under her spell, marry this great lady and take over the overworld in her honor and they can rule together and you know, all that fun stuff. But for one hour, he's strapped into his silver chair and he regains his memory. He knows who he is. He knows that he is Prince Rillian. He knows that he is the son of King Caspian the Tenth. He is of Narnia. He should not be here. But the Earthmen are also under a spell and they don't free him. They can't, even if they wanted to, right? But because Eustace, Jill, and Puddleglum are now in the castle, they are able to find him quite easily, actually, before he's under, you know, his, his memories back. He tells them that no matter what happens, don't free him under his spelled version. But as soon as he is himself. He says in the name of Narnia, basically, the name of Aslan, release him. And they finally go, oh, okay, that was our last thing. We actually did it right this time. And they free him. He destroys the chair. They come across the lady again. What are you eating, child? Hold on. Um, I, you're coming with me. Okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. cool. What are you doing? What are you doing? Give me this. You cannot have it. You're cute though. Terribly sorry about that. She tried to eat some paper. Where was I? Ah oh, yes. He destroys the chair and that's when the Lady of the Green Kirtle shows up. She <laughs> is not very thrilled that the chair is destroyed and he's freed from his spell. So she tries to use music to more or less wipe their memory to just get them to forget Narnia, forget Aslan, forget who they are, that they've ever been to another world. That doesn't work very long because her spell is also part of the music and something that she tossed into the fire, some sort of dust. And while the fire was burning, she's able to use the, the music and distract them. So Puddleglum uses his foot and puts out the fire. Instantly, everybody gets their, I wouldn't say memory, but they get themselves back. And she's killed. And when she dies, everything goes south. Because now all the Earthmen remember that they don't want to be this close to the surface. 
They're gnomes. They want to be underground. They don't want to be anywhere near the surface, but they've been digging this whole time to get out so they can conquer it. Conquer the above land in the name of the Lady of the Green Kirtle, who, by the way, is the person that turned into a giant snake and killed his mom. Queen Lily died because of her. Again, I'm calling her Lily because that makes my life easier. <laughs> she didn't technically have a name, to the best of my knowledge, in either book, but, you know. Uh, she was killed by the same lady who then took her son and then was going to try and take over Narnia and... Why didn't you just marry him? You know, you didn't have to conquer and murder. You could have just married the prince and saved a lot of hassle, you know? But the queen is now dead. Everything is starting to fall apart. Water's rising. The gnomes need to go back down even further. And these guys need to get out before, you know, they drown. So they get their horses and they run. Eventually, they get to the dig site. Jill goes up first. She's yoinked. Everybody panics down below, but she realizes that, hey, yeah, she's in Narnia. Everybody else gets out. They find where Caspian's ship had finally returned without the prince, but he did get to see Aslan, so, you know, all was well. Prince Rillian and Caspian are reunited, and spoiler, Caspian promptly dies. Uh, he died happy, at least. And as he's been found out that Caspian's dead, the prince is returned. Eustace and Jill are returned to that hill where they started. And Aslan shows them a younger version of Caspian because he's gone. And this is part of Aslan's territory, so, you know, it's fine. Caspian gets to go back with them for a little bit to deal with the bullies, and he's just a menace, <laughs> and I loved that. The people that the bullies got to see, they saw him in a younger version, and they saw the back of Aslan. You can't see his face in our world, and that makes sense, because in scripture you can't see the face of God and live, so they see his back. Caspian's a menace, the bullies are dealt with, Caspian goes back. And that's more or less where that story ends. Would I read this one again? Maybe? I wasn't too keen on the parts where they were underground and that was a good chunk of it. It's probably a 4 out of 5. And my critiques? Not really all that many outside of, you know, if you want to take over the kingdom, don't murder the mom. Get in good with the future king and marry him. Have heirs. Play the long game. Don't do murder and spells. You could have saved yourself some hassle there, girl. Think smart. Work smart, not hard, you know? And that's my review. Ooh.